everyone. My name is Florina Montanescu, and I'm a developer advocate at Google. So in the last few months, together with three of my colleagues, we've been working on bringing Plaid back in fashion. So more precisely, Plaid is an application that was initially developed by my colleague, Nick Butcher, as a way of showcasing material design. And what you see here is actually the state of the app in 2016, when it was pretty much, let's say, Plaid's glory days. So Nick used here a lot of the APIs from the animations, transitions, animated vector drawables. So all of these really made the app shine. They really improved the user experience. So Plaid integrates data from three different sources. And well, these sources from 2016 until now, well, some of them were deprecated. So that meant that uh, out of three sources, we were left with one and a little bit. So from all of these nice, fancy UI features that we had, well, we were left with almost nothing. We, we were left with, with a pretty boring application. So we decided we didn't want to leave it like this. And we decided that we wanted to fix this broken functionality. But apart from this, we also knew that we wanted to go towards something that's modular and extensible from the architecture point of view. But the thing is that Plaid was developed as a UI sample. Not, not as an architecture sample. So you won't be surprised to see all the tight dependencies in the, in the code. And well, code that was actually a bit behind, because Nick started building this in 2014. At that time, we didn't have the guide to app architecture that we released last year. And also, although we had Kotlin, we didn't really use it. So we knew that we wanted to rebuild Plaid, but we wanted to rebuild it in the right way, to have it in a good state for any future changes that we wanted to build. So in this talk, I want to tell you what we've learned and also how we, were managed, how we managed to leverage Kotlin in our app. So we released this opinionated guide to the app architecture. But if you read it, you'll see that it's also still quite vague. So we have these like main classes, some idea of how we should architect our app. But we decided that we want to create some clear guidelines. So we defined some main types of classes in our app. And we also define a set of rules for each of these classes. So let's see which ones these were. So we define a remote data source, whose role is actually to just construct the request data fetch the data from the, from the API service. And that's it. It would only request the information and return the response received. Next, we would have a local data source, whose role is just to store data on disk. So it would either do this in shared preferences or in the database. Next, we would have the repository, whose role is to fetch and, st and store data. And optionally, it could also do in-memory cache. So the repository will be the class that mediates between the local and the remote data source. Because the, um, the business logic was quite complex, we decided to add another layer. We decided to add use cases. So the role of the use cases is just to process data based on business logic. These would be small, lightweight classes that could be also reused. So the use cases would depend on repositories and or other use cases. Next, we would have a view model. So the view model's role is to expose data to be displayed by the UI, and also to trigger actions based on the user's actions. And the view model would depend on use cases. As an input, the view model would get maybe IDs. So it would get IDs in the case where it's a view model for a details screen, for example. And of course, it would get the user's actions as an input. And as an output, it would um, return a live data. Next, in the UI, we would work with activities and XML. So the role of these is to just display the data and to forward actions to the view model. As an input, they would get the optional ID and the user's actions. So we looked at our application or at our architecture, and we divided it into three layers, data, domain, and the UI layer. We decided to go one step further and be a bit more opinionated in the way we're using the data um, or in the libraries that we're using. So we knew that the live data um, really shines when it's used together with an activity or a fragment. So we decided to really keep the live data only between the view model and the UI. And that's it. 
And even more, because of the nice integration between live data and data binding, we decided to also use uh, data binding in our XMLs. But again, still with all of these constraints and all of these guidelines that we've set, there are so many ways in which we can actually implement this kind of architecture. And we knew that Kotlin and the Kotlin language features will help us improve this even more. And more precisely, what we particularly like are the functional constructs that Kotlin supports. So actually, one of the first decisions that we had to make was how do we handle asynchronous operations? And we decided to work with coroutines as the pretty much backbone of our app. Because with coroutines, it's easy to just uh, launch a coroutine and handle the response. And more precisely, what we liked is uh, the fact that coroutines have a scope. So for example, let's say that you're opening the activity, you're triggering a network request. You want to make sure that when you're pressing back and exiting that activity, you're also canceling that network request. So this scope, scoping of the coroutines, was something that we liked. So this meant that we decided that in the view model would be the place where we're launching and we're canceling coroutines. And we're also making that transition between coroutines and live data. But then for all the other layers above the view model, we would just use suspension functions. But these suspension functions would return a result class. So more precisely, this result will have two types, success or error. And this is because we wanted to make sure that we're not throwing exceptions here and there, but rather that these exceptions, those errors, represent a state. So what's, uh, what's interesting in Kotlin is that if you want to um, be able to extend the class, you have to mark it as open. So this means that classes are final by default, and you have to be intentional uh, when using inheritance. So this means that Kotlin really supports this idea, this best practices of uh, favoring composition versus inheritance. But we can do better than using uh, open classes. We can use a sealed class. Because with a sealed class, uh, we can restrict the class hierarchies. It means that we can't extend the class outside this file. So a lot of times when we would use this result class, we will typically use it inside a when. So first of all, when supports smart casts. So this meant that it was easy to do when result is success, do something, when result is error, do something else. But because every time we were using it, we wanted to make sure that we're always handling every case. We wanted to make sure that if, I don't know, by mistake, we're not handling something, we wanted the compiler to tell us that, hey, you forgot something. You forgot to handle the error case. So this meant that the when needs to be exhaustive. But when is exhaustive only when used as an expression. So we added, we created the exhaustive um, property. So more precisely, we created an extension property on T where we're just returning the object. Here's another um, problem that we had. So we had a comment class and a comment with replies. So the difference between these two is in the fact that the comment also holds the information about the user that posted the comment. So it will have the display name and the portrait URL. Whereas the comment with replies is pretty much a tree structure that holds the replies of the comment and the replies of the replies and so on. But what we had to do was to build a comment out of the comment with replies and a user object. So you say, OK, that's easy. We would just create a new constructor that gets as parameters the user and the comment for replies, and that's it. But the thing is that we didn't really like this because the classes were in two different layers. And why should the comment know about the comment with replies? Why should it know necessarily about the user? Maybe the data comes from somewhere else. Why should we need to change this, uh, this API? So what we ended up using is an extension function. So more precisely, we build an extension function to the comment with replies that, based on the user object, it would create a comment. So this, um, when you're building an extension function, you only have access to the, um, to the public um, fields. So this means that we're not, by mistake, accessing or changing any private implementation data. And it allows us to keep our classes focused, focused on what they do without extending them. 
So it meant that we didn't have to change the public API, and we would avoid accessing private implementation details. So what I like about data classes is the fact that they're value objects, and this actually shines in when used in tests. So for example, we had an upvote flag um, in the comment. So when we build a test to check whether a comment is upvoted, we would create our comment with the upvoted flag to false, we would upvote the comment, and then we would uh, check whether the expected result is similar to the comment, the initial comment, but with that upvoted flag to true. But the thing is that, especially in our case, because the comment had so many fields, it was easy to make mistakes, and it was easy to miss what's actually important here, the fact that the upvoted flag has changed. With Kotlin, you can use the copy method. And there, we would just um, create a copy of the object um, and that it's called on, and we're setting the flag, the flag that we're actually changing. And that's it. The code ends up being more concise and more readable, more comprehensible. So let's take another example. So we had another, um, uh, in our app, we were working with a remote data source to post a comment. Um, to post a comment. And here we would expose a suspension function that will return a result. And inside this method, we would create a new comment request, we would trigger that request to the backend, we would await for the response, and then we would handle the response, building either a result success or a result of error, depending on what's needed. But if you look at this code, this is actually not enough. Because in the case when um, your device is offline, this code will crash. So what we actually had to do is to wrap every request inside a try catch. And we have a lot of requests. So we saw that we kept on adding and adding this try catch everywhere. And then our methods were bolted, bloated. So we couldn't really focus on what really mattered, on building the response, triggering the request. So what we did is create a top-level function. So this would be a suspension function that would get as a parameter a suspending lambda and the error message. So here, we would just trigger the call, wrap it inside a try catch, and then we would build, in case of an exception, a result of error based on the error message we passed in. So that this means that in our remote data source, we could just um, create a safe API call and then put the code that actually matters for us inside another function. Like this, the code became more readable, more easy to understand. So this safe API call, I was saying that it has the call as a first parameter and then the error message as the second one. But in Kotlin, if, you, uh, if the last parameter of a method is a lambda, it means that you can use this um, as a trailing lambda. So that meant that when you're calling this, instead of passing these two parameters, we can just pass the error message as a parameter of the function and then uh, use the trailing lambda syntax to call the method. So like this, the code becomes more concise. But is it really more readable? So when we looked at this, it felt like what matters here the most is the error message, which is not really the case. What matters for us a lot is that the method that gets called is this post comment. So we decided that although the code is more concise, it doesn't mean more readable. So brevity isn't necessarily a good thing. So even if Kotlin offers all of these kind of options and features, be mindful and think whether you actually need all of these or use them in the right places. Here's another um, example. So as soon as we were switching to Kotlin, especially in our activities, the first thing that we did is make all of our views late in it because we didn't want to handle all of this nullability. But then we looked again at our code, and we saw that we shouldn't do this that some views, for example, our no result views, were only inflated when specific conditions are met. So actually, nullability was good. Nullability can be meaningful. Nullability was telling us that something is missing, and we should really handle it. So overall, we saw how all of these features from Kotlin, like coroutines and immutability and functions as first-class citizens can help us shape our app. And together with the guide to app architecture, help us build this maintainable, this safer and faster to develop uh, architecture that we wanted to have. 
Thank you.